Well, welcome everyone. Uh, we've just got a few minutes before we're going to get started here. Uh, you're joining us for the Ojibwe Storytelling Series with Michael Charette tonight. And we're, we're, what we'd like for you to do, if, if you could get into the chat box right now and just type your name and tell us where you're from. We always like to see where people are, call, are viewing from, I guess I should say. I am joining you from Ashland, Wisconsin. I live in Bad River, but I am at work tonight. Oh, Sam is from Hinkley. Oh boy, they're coming fast and furious. Minneapolis, Round Hills, Monona, Lake Tomahawk. I actually know where that is. Uh, Whitewater, Duluth, Bayfield. So you got some friends here, Michael, from Redcliffe and Bayfield joining you tonight. Uh, I'm gonna have to pull these up. Madison, Rhinelander, Ashland, my sister from Milwaukee, my other sister from Duluth, Bob hey. from Janesville. Mm. I just saw Tennessee and Chicago and Canada. Winnipeg, <laughs> Manitoba. <laughs> Welcome, Canada. That's fantastic. Dousman. So it's, it's just, it's great to have all of you here. We're all very, very excited here. Um, and we are almost gonna get ready. Another Ontario friend, Pam from Washburn, very, very cold in Washburn. It is very cold here. Uh, Michael and I live not far away from each other and we both have about negative three right now. That's not counting wind chill. That's just straight up temps. Although Sudbury, Ontario might be colder. Kristen, Amy, where are you guys joining us from tonight? I'm at home, cozy in Madison. <laughs> And I'm in New Berlin, Wisconsin. Nice. Fuju from central Wisconsin, Muskego, Quincy, Florida. Now you have it warm. Christine, welcome, welcome. Landa Lakes. Oh, it's just great to see everyone. There's a Redcliffe member from Iron River. Elmhurst, Fond du Lac, Alexandra, Virginia. Alexandria, sorry. Mille Lacs. Jack from Poland. Is that Poland the country or is there a town named Poland in Wisconsin? I'm trying to remember. Bella from Redlands. That's my, my daughter, Bella. <laughs> Thanks, Belle. <laughs> and she's out in California, sunny, warm California. How are we doing on time, ladies? We're ready to roll? I think we're ready are. if you are. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, so what we're going to do from now on uh, is we're going to close the chat box for now and probably keep it closed throughout the whole evening. Michael's going to, going to share with us his culture and his stories and his flute playing. And if you have any questions, put them in the Q&A box. There are two separate things down there. There's Q&A and then there's chat. We're going to close chat because it kind of pops up and we don't want to distract Michael. But Q&A is something that Amy and Kristen and I are gonna be monitoring uh, the whole time. And uh, at the end, there'll be about five minutes for, for Michael to take some questions. Kristen, can you move to the next slide? And this is something uh, we have now because many of you have seen him before. He's played at Big Top Chautauqua. He's played in lots of schools. He's done quite a few Zooms, he says. And he's certainly on Facebook. You can find him at Tales of Laughing Fox or just under Michael Charette. Um, he's got uh, a website there. He's got a YouTube channel, uh, Instagram. So there's lots of different ways you can find Michael after. So if we don't get to your question, I do apologize, but you certainly will be able to, to get a hold of him after. You can also send us an email as well. Uh, all right, now if I'd like to introduce Michael, Michael's a Redcliffe uh, tribal member of the Chippewa Nation. Chippewa and Ojibwe are the same thing. I always like to tell people because they get confused. But uh, Michael is joining us from just up the road from me, a uh, very talented artist. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over to him so he can introduce himself in our language and give him as much time because I know that's what you guys are here for. So thank you for joining us tonight and take it away, Michael. Oh, miigwech, miigwech. Um, Buju in Dunaway, Maganiduk. Hello to my relatives. Bapewa Gush Nindijinikaj. Laughing Fox is my name. 
Miskwabi Kong Nindunjaba. Red Cliff is where I'm from. Nindamigizi Dudem. I'm from the Eagle Clan. It's a great honor for me to be able to come and present um, stories and flute music from the Anishinaabe culture. And um, I'm very, very honored to be here to see so many uh, people um, logging in and, and checking it out. Um, what I'm going to do tonight is just share with you some of the stories that I've learned along my journey. And one of the things that I have been doing in the past um, is talking a lot about the flute. And my elders had told me to do a, a traditional Anishinaabe introduction in our language and tell you my clan and my name and where I'm from. And also talk about the flute, um, because the flute is an instrument of, um, of healing. It's an it's a instrument of, that was created out of love, you know, unconditional love. You know, um, it was, it's one of the oldest instruments. It's right up there with the drum. And the drum represents the heartbeat of the earth, you know, the, and it's also the first, the first song, the first song, the first music that we hear while we are in our mother's um, womb. You know, we hear that heartbeat. Uh, another um, old instrument is the rain stick or the rattle, you know, because that represents the water, you know, and we all, all living beings need the, the water to survive. And then we come into uh, the Native American courting flute, or the flute in general. And every culture all across the world has some sort of a flute. You know, they have some sort of a, a instrument like this. And they all have uh, different creation stories. And tonight it's my honor to share with you the creation story of the flute that I have learned. <laughs> A long time ago, in a village, there was a young man. And this young man was of courting age. And he fell in love with this young woman in his village. And he would try to go up to her and let her know how he felt about her. And when he would try to do this, um, he just couldn't, he couldn't express himself. You know, he was just too um, enamored by how beautiful she was. You know, so he kind of stayed in the background and, and he watched as other young men of courting age um, would go and present her with gifts and, and speak with her. And this kind of frustrated him. And he remembered in his stories that there was a, a love medicine out there. And he thought to himself that if he could find this love medicine, that he could present it to her, and then she would know how he felt about her. He had heard that the Ayabe, which is a huge albino buck that lives to the west, carried the love medicine. And he thought that if he could find this Ayabe, then he could get that medicine. So he packed up a bunch of provisions and he set out into the woods. And he found the biggest set of tracks out in the woods that he could find. And he thought to himself, this is it. This has got to be the Ayabe. So he followed the trail and he's going through the woods and he's, he's watching. And, and once in a while, out of the corner of his eye, he would see a blur go by, a white blur out of the corner of his eye. And he would pull back his bow and arrow and it would be gone. And this, this happened for days and days and days. Finally, exhausted from his travels, he made this fire underneath this great cedar tree. And as he sat there thinking about his heart's desire, he started to drift off into sleep. And that's when he heard the night song. He drifted off to sleep. And the next day he awoke to a knocking. And when he opened his eyes and he looked up into the tree, he could see on one of the branches there was a bird. And the bird had been knocking holes into the branch. And it flew off and it flew away. 
And just then the wind had picked up. And when the wind went over that branch, it made that noise. He knew that that was the noise. That was the sound that he was looking for. And he got up and he reached up into that tree and he grabbed a hold of that branch and he broke it off. And as he was sitting there examining it, he was trying to get the, the noise to come out of it. So he was blowing on it like this. He's blowing on it this way. He was even swirling it around in the air, trying to get the, the effect of that wind going across that branch. But to no avail, he could not figure it out. So he took some asema, some sacred tobacco, and he said a prayer to the spirit of that bird. And he offered that tobacco to his fire. And as he sat there waiting for an answer, he drifted off into sleep again. And in his dreams, the bird had visited him. And it asked him, what is it that you seek? And the young man told him his dilemma, told him about his heart's desire, told him about the other young men in his village and how they were presenting his heart's desire with these gifts and how frustrating that was. And as the spirit bird listened to him, he finally took pity on the young man and he said, yes, I'll help you. And he began to instruct the young man on how long to make the flute only go this far past your hand. He told him where to put the holes. And he said, when you blow into the flute, keep your heart's desire here and see it here. And when you blow into the flute, into the bibi guan, which is the Ojibwe word for flute, it'll come out and it'll wabi guan. Wabi guan is the Ojibwe word for flower. And as he spent some time in the woods, following the instructions from the spirit bird, he constructed the first bibi guan and he brought it back to his village. And as he stood on a hill, he could see everybody down in the village. They were all working, they were all doing their thing. Some people were dancing wild rice. Some people were gathering berries. Some people were smoking fish and he stood up on that hill and he closed his eyes and he had, he had his heart's desire here. He felt it here. And he took a deep breath and he began to play. And the sound made its way down the hill into the village where the people were working. And everybody that heard that sound stopped immediately what they were doing. And they all looked up toward the source of the sound. Nobody had ever heard anything like it. Finally, the sound made its way to the wigwam, the home of the young woman. And when she heard it, she knew instantly that that was for her. And she came out of her wigwam to look for the source of the sound. And she looked up on the hill and could see that young man standing up there playing something to create that sound. And she knew who it was. And she always wondered why he never talked to her. So she went up and stood next to him and she closed her eyes. And she was so amazed and overwhelmed that somebody could express so much emotion without uttering a single word. And as she listened to the song, she realized it was intertwining their souls together.
Aha, miigwech, miigwech. When I first started to learn about the Anishinaabe culture, um, I was really, really young. I was very young. Um, I was blessed to have the same uh, Ojibwe language teacher, language teacher, storyteller, arts and crafts person from uh, kindergarten all the way till I graduated high school. And every winter, um, our teacher would come to our class at our school and she would tell us stories of the Anishinaabe people in other culture, in the ways. And one of the first stories that I learned while I was in uh, kindergarten, you know, when you're young in that age, you have a lot of energy and you run all over the place, you know, and me and all the other kids were doing just that. We were running all over the place, you know, and she would come in there and she would say, Beka, Beka, you know, hold on, wait, wait. I'm Beoma, come here. Isn't done. Listen, she said, I want to tell you a story about Winobuju. And we all looked around thinking, who is Winobuju? You know, and she said, Winobuju is our trickster. He's also our hero. He teaches us how to live and oftentimes how not to live. And she goes, come gather around, sit in a circle and, and bizant on and listen. And all of us kids, you know, in, in kindergarten, we all, we all go and circle up around her and I'll sit on the floor as she would tell these stories to us. She goes, now all you kids are all running around here thinking that you guys know everything. Well, I'm going to tell you a story about Winobuju and about him seeking knowledge. And she said a long time ago when Winobuju was just a young boy, when he was just as big as you guys in here now, he would go around his village and he would talk to the elders and he would, he would tell the elders, you know, what to do. Some of them were fixing their wigwams. He would tell them the best way how to fix that. Some of them were making traps and he would go and tell them the best way and how they should do that. And they all had the same response. Oh, Winobuju, you know, Bazani on, be quiet, Mahjong. You know, go away. You're just a kid yet. You know, you, you got a, you got a lot of learning to do, you know, Mahjong, go away. You don't have that experience yet. And this frustrated Winobuju, you know, at the time, Winobuju always sought the counsel of Nokomis, his grandmother. And this time was no different. He went out into the woods and he sought the counsel of Nokomis. And he said, Nokomis, Nokomis. And she said, yes, Winobuju, what is it? And he says, I have a problem. She goes, oh, tell me, Winobuju. He said, when I go through the, the village and I see people doing these things, he said, I try to tell them how to do it better. He's like, but none of them want to listen to me. You know, they all say I'm just a dumb little kid and I should go away and go and play and be a kid. He's like, but I want to help. And he's like, and I know my ways are the best. And she goes, well, what are you, what are you looking for, Winobuju? He said, I know you're very knowledgeable in medicines, Nokomis. He said, is there, is there any medicine out there that'll help me get smarter? And she was kind of confused. She goes, really, Winobuju? And he said, yeah. He said, when I'm, when I'm the smartest man alive, everybody's going to listen to me. I'll know everything. And she thought about this for a while and she goes, you know, Winobuju, I just might have the right mshkiki for you. I just might have the right medicine for you, but you all have to go and look for it and gather it and you'll have to come back. So Winobuju was really happy about this. So he went off into the woods, you know, and he was, he was thinking about how everybody was going to listen to him. He was going to be the smartest man alive and, and he had all these delusions of grandeur. And finally, he was so excited that he was going to become the smartest man alive. He went back to Nokomis and sought her out and he found her by her wigwam. He said, Nokomis, Nokomis, he said, did you find the medicine that will help me get smarter? And she said, yes, Winobuju, yes, I did. 
And she reached into her pocket and she pulled out a leather pouch and she opened it up. And she goes, here, Wenobuju, eat these. These will help you get smarter. And he goes, what are they, Grandma? What are they, Nokomis? And she said, why, they're smart berries. She goes, you eat these and you'll get smarter. And when Obuju came up close and he looked down in her hand, and he looked up at her again, skeptical, and he looked down again and he smelled the smart berries and he made this face and he went, oh, no, Kamis. He said, that's rabbit poop. And Nokomis goes, oh, see, Wenobuju, it's working. You're getting smarter already. That's one of, uh, one of the first stories that I learned um, from my teacher, from my Nokomis. Um, you know, it's a, a teaching story. And most, most of our stories have... Uh, moral and, and value in them, you know, and sometimes she would leave it up to us to interpret it. And other times she would, um, you know, let us know the moral of it. And all throughout high school, all throughout grade school, middle school, she was always there for me to, to give me these stories. And, um, this was a time when Ojibwe language um, wasn't doing so well, you know, uh, with colonization, with, uh, you know, oppression. The, she was one of our only fluent Ojibwe speakers in the village. And she was trying hard to revitalize that. And at a young age, she was teaching us um, Ojibwe language. And one of the things that she would teach us was uh, Ojibwe bingo. And uh, it was everybody's favorite day when she would come in and we would play Ojibwe bingo. She would have a placemat, all these different animals cut out, you know, the bear, the wolf, the fish, you know, and she would tell us, you know, we'd be sitting there and we'd be listening to her and she would say, she would say, Makwa, Makwa. Ijinikado Smokey. Uh, back then, Smokey the bear was pretty big. And that, that gave us the hint. She would give us those hints, you know. Ijinikado is sometimes called Smokey. Oh, Smokey the bear. You know, or she would say, uh, Gigu, Gigu, Ijinikado Charlie. Charlie Tuna, you know, the fish. So we would put it, you know, right there. And then we would say, bingo, whoever would get three in a row. You know, this was only little kids back then. Three in a row was a good bingo. And, uh, you know, what we would win would be a little tiny cup of popped wild rice with a little bit of salt on it. You know, and when you won that bingo, that you would start another game. But you could sit there and then just have your little bit of popped wild rice and uh and that that was the beginning education um of of relearning uh the anishinaabe ways and language culture for me you know and she would go on to tell us stories you know because winter time is a time for stories she would talk about a time when the world was forever cold you know going back to the ice age because our stories go back so far. You know, we, we have an oral history, a living history. You know, and it goes back generations and generations so far that, uh, you know, we don't even know how far it goes back. You know, there's evidence of people living around the, the Lake Superior system going back, um, back to the Ice Age, which is about 11,000 years ago. And it reflects that in our stories. Her stories would start with us talking about animals and about their importance to us and how much they pitied us and how much they helped us. She said, when we come out crying into this world, we're cold and we cry and we need our animals. You know, we need them 
to keep us warm, to feed us. And the animals give themselves to us. And we always have to respect that. She would always tell us that the, the, the human is one of the most pitiful of creatures on Mother Earth. She would tell us stories about animals going out of their way to help us. She told us one story once where a group of animals climbed up to the highest mountain they could and they all took turns trying to break a hole in the sky. And when they finally succeeded and made a hole in the sky, the sun shone down and it began to warm Mother Earth. You know, we as Anishinaabe, as indigenous people, as all over the world have creation stories for everything. We have creation stories about the Apostle Islands, which is where I live on Lake Superior. We have the Apostle Islands. We have creation stories of why the raccoon wears a mask. And we even have creation stories on why the dogs smell each other's butts. And as little kids, we would all giggle and we would all want to hear that one. And she would say to us, a long time ago, all the animals would gather in council. And all the mukwa would gather, all the bear, you know, all the fox would gather. You know, all the animals would gather in their own separate councils. And all the dogs would gather too in their own lodge. And as the dogs were having their, their meeting, you know, they would take off their coats before they went in. They would take them off, you know, to become equal. And they were hanging them up outside their lodge on poles. And as they went into the lodge, you know, they went in to discuss serious onimush business. Onimush is the Ojibwe word for a dog. To discuss some serious onimush business. Maybe it was chasing about chasing squirrels, chasing around Gaja Gaints, cat. So while they were all in this, this big circle in this lodge, you know, the Animushug from all over the world, you know, were gathered in this one lodge. And they were sitting there discussing all these, all these things. And there was this little bitty dog, little bitty dog just sitting there listening, you know, to all the important stories. And then he felt something. There was a churning and a bubbling sound coming from his belly. And he kind of looked around, you know, and, and he was watching. Everybody was in serious ceremony mood. You know, they were all, oh, yes, yes. And then he realized that he had to boogie. He had to fart. So as he's sitting there listening, he thinks he can hold it and make it through this till the end of the ceremony. But he, he just can't. His belly's just rumbling and gurgling and churning. And he's even like trying to sit on his hind legs a little bit, trying to like help him out. But that's not even helping so he thinks to himself that if he can, you know, bend over a little bit and little, let a little bit out, you know, he'll be, you know, <laughs> he'll be good. So that, that's what he tried to do. He tried to kind of bend over while they were talking a little bit and try to let it out without making a, a sound. But it didn't work that way. He let out this huge boogie. And all the other animals kind of looked around. And they saw this, this huge noise that came out of this little bitty dog and they all kind of, kind of laughed about it a little bit, you know, like, and then they went back into talking about the serious honey mush business. Well, you know, that smell, you know, it, it rose up, it rose up in the lodge, you know, and it started to come back down and dogs, they have very good noses, you know, very good. And at first everybody was okay. But then, you know, they started to sniff. Oh man, they couldn't believe it. You know, so they think, oh, okay, we can still do this serious dog business. And then pretty soon their eyes start to sting. And then pretty soon they were, they were coughing in there. And pretty soon all the animals were, 
were getting all moving around, got up. And they all, they couldn't take it anymore. They had to get air. They were like, we need air, get fresh air in here. And they all started to run out. Their eyes were burning. Their noses were running. And as they pushed their way out of the lodge, they didn't care. They just started to grab whoever's coat was there. And they grabbed this coat, put it on, and they left. You know, and all the animals left, left the ceremonial lodge that day. And they all took off and, and ran away. And it is told by my teachers that when dogs now meet each other, because their noses are so strong that that's the only way that they could tell if that's their coat. And when you see dogs meet each other today, that's the first thing that they do is they go around to under the tail and they sniff, you know, is that my coat? Are you wearing my coat? Oh, oh, oh. Miigwech, miigwech. Just a, just a story. Just a fun, a fun story um, about the Animush, about the dogs. And, um, you know, there, there's stories, like I said, there's creation stories for everything. Uh, it reminds me of another dog story that I heard from her. And this one is really interesting. Uh, she had said that one time that the dogs, you know, were part of the animal kingdom, but something had happened to them. And she said a long time ago, you know, that they were all worked together with all the other animals. And she was, um, the dog was, uh, started to hang out with the human. You know, the human started to feed the dog. So the dogs were, were hanging out, kind of getting a free meal. And the humans fell out of balance. And they began to take more than what they needed. And they, be, they began to take more of the animals than what they needed, you know, and this troubled the, the animal kingdom very much that they had to have a huge meeting about this. And all the animals gathered, including the Animush, in a big meeting. And they all discussed the humans and how the humans were living out of balance and how they were treating the animals how they were treating their brothers and sisters. And the animals couldn't take any more abuse from the humans. And they decided that they were gonna go and they were gonna kill the humans and they were gonna take care of them once and for all. And as they discussed plans and, and, and decided to ambush, ambush the humans, um, the Animush listened, you know, he listened to all their plans and and later on that night, the Animush, he snuck off. He snuck out and he went and he went back to the man's camp, back to the village. And he went and he told the men what the animals had planned. He told them uh, what they were going to do. And the, the humans then discussed on what they were going to do. And so when the, when the humans came to the point where, um, where the trap was laid, they in turn turned around and began killing all the animals that they could. And all the animals that were there that were going to ambush them, they all took off and ran away. You know, they ran away and they, they, they met at a different place so that they can gather their strength again and talk about what happened. And while they were there talking about what happened and about this failed attempt, you know, the Animush, the dog showed up and they knew that the Animush had betrayed them. They knew that the dog had betrayed them. So as the dog came into their, their lodge, they said, you, they said, you are no longer welcome within the animal kingdom. You are no longer welcome with us. He goes, you love man so much. He said, you can go and be with the man then. And he said, and man is cruel. And when they're mad at you, they'll kick you. And he's like, when they're mad at you, they won't feed you. He said, they'll forget you. 
<clears throat> and the Animosh then was kicked out of the animal kingdom and was not allowed back in. But the Animosh loved man so much that even to this day, when you walk with your dog out into the woods and they hear something out there, right away, they turn and they bark. Arr, arr, arr. You know, they, they alert humans that there's something over there. You know, they still take care of the human. Even though the human has put them through so much, the Animush still loves the man unconditional. I just thought that would be a good story to share. It just came out of the blue, you know. Before we started, I put down some tobacco. It's the way that we pray. And um, I asked that I tell the stories of my teacher, uh, Dolores Bainbridge, who became my nokomis, my grandmother, in a good way. And one of the things she would always say, you know, I never know what I'm going to say when I come up here and I start talking. She goes, I just talk from the heart. And I let that, you know, do the rest. She goes, the story, the story comes out in the way that it does. And with that animal story, I'll share another flute song. Now this flute is a bone flute. And it was given to me by one of my friends. And when he gave it to me, he said that it was a, he said that it was a wolf bone flute and that he had carved it out of a wolf's bone. So I took the flute and I went off into the woods. That's where I learned how to play the flute, was out in the woods listening to my environment. I can't really uh, read music. And for the first two years, I've been playing flute for about 20 years now, but for the first two years, I, I stayed exclusively into the woods, just playing um, for the spirits. And in doing so, I was able to uh, develop my own technique, you know, and later I would learn how to build them and I would learn uh, creation stories for them. And as I was out in the woods making a, a song with, with this flute, you know, I, I recorded it. It's called uh, the Wolf Bone Echo. It's called Echo. And uh, I put I put that story in the description that it's a wolf's bone and I got it from my friend and he's got the other side of the wolf, the other leg. And he said, one day we'll come together and play. You know, he said, maybe the wolves will call back. So I was out there trying to call the wolves. And uh, after I posted the story and the the, the music, he, he messaged me and he said, oh, wait, no. He's like, he's like, it's not a wolf bone flute. He said, it's a cougar bone flute. And I was like, oh, oh all right, all right. I was like, okay, that kind of makes sense. And he was like, well, well, how so? And I said, well, that'll explain why all the aunties come out while I'm playing. He said, aunties? I said, yeah, that's the Ojibwe word for cougar. <laughs> So, this is the, uh, this song is called, uh, Maingan.
Timmy glitch, Timmy glitch. As I was in um, learning my culture and my ways, um, she would tell us the importance of the Ojibwe language. And she would use different things and different stories. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that are hidden in the language. Uh, you know, values, morals, good things. And uh, I heard uh, James uh, Volklich explain it in this way. He said, when we introduce ourselves, we say, Buju in Dunaway, Magani Duk, hello to all my relatives. And he said that word, in Dunaway, Magani Duk, um, doesn't just mean you, uh, your relatives, your, your aunts, your uncles, your parents, your grandparents. He says, in Dunaway, Magani Duk, means all of my relations, uh, honoring that living. That, that spirit in everything, that spirit in that tree, the spirit in that river, you know, the, the spirit that, that resides in all things. And, you know, a long time ago on Turtle Island, uh, that's what we call, you know, North America, Turtle Island, uh, when you had a whole society of an indigenous population believing that, that everything has a spirit, then it makes it that much harder for us to take. You know, today, you know, we're kind of offenders of the great rule, you know, habitual offenders of the great rule of take only what you need, you know, and that word, in Dunaway Maganiduk, all my relations, all my relatives is such a powerful word. And that's only one of many. You know, our language was outlawed um, until uh, 1978. You know, uh, we got here in the States, in the United States, we had freedom of religion in 1978. And in 1968, we had freedom of speech. And that's only 40, you know, 43 years ago. And before that, we had generations of silence. So now as we go forward and, and relearn, you know, our culture, um, you know, we realize that um, sharing our stories and our language is a way to help preserve it and pass it on uh, to the next generations. And I would sit in Ojibwe language class, you know, and I was kind of a trickster back then. And she would always get down on me, you know, my teacher, Dolores Bainbridge, my nokomis. She would say, Bazanian, you know, Bizantan, you know, be quiet and listen. And she would go in, you know, I would wonder, well, you know, why is the language so important? And she would, she would um, tell us stories to answer our questions. And she said a long time ago, you know, um, back when we started to lose our language, she goes, there was two young children, a boy and a girl that would go on visit their Mishomis who lived out in the bush, lived out in the woods, their uh, grandfather. And she would, she would, uh, the mother would send them off with the grandfather, you know, they'd go and visit and they loved it because they were out in the woods and they could play. And one day they found this spot out in the woods, you know, in a big open spot. And as they were playing, they heard a, a voice saying something out in the woods. And as they listened, they heard this voice say, Anindi the Toyan. And they looked at each other, you know, because they didn't know what it meant. Anindi the Toyan. And they were afraid. So they ran all the way back to their grandfathers from out of the woods and they came in and they said, Mishomis, Mishomis, grandfather, you know, we hear something in the woods. We don't know what it's saying, but 
we think that you might know because we heard you speak that language before. And the grandfather said, oh, oh, really? Well, sh come show me the spot. Show me where to go. And they led their grandfather back to the back to the place in the woods where they heard that that sound and that noise. You know, Anindi the Toyan. And the grandfather heard it. And he looked at the kids and he he shouted back. Odatun Aya Gi Mikanan. And he told his grandchildren, now come, come back, let's go. Let's go. And later on that night, when they're sitting around the fire, the little kids asked the Mishomis, they asked their grandfather, Grandfather, what was that voice? And what did you say? And the Mishomis said, that voice was saying, Anindi de Toyan. It means, where should I put it? And I shouted back to him, Atun Aya Gi Mikanan. Put it back where you found it. He explained to the kids, he said, You see, when the spirit was alive, it had taken something that did not belong to it. And that prevented the spirit from going and traveling on to the next world. And I told him, Odatun Aya Gimekanan, put it back where you found it. And the little kids thought about that for a little while. And, you know, as time went on, they, they went back out in the woods and they listened for that voice again. But they couldn't hear it. It was gone. Now, when we're little kids and we hear these types of stories, you know, they're, they're instilled in us, they're embedded in us. And, you know, don't take what does not belong to you, you know, became, uh, became a part of who I am. And that's why these stories are so important to pass on. You know, generations of generations of Anishinaabe have, have used these stories as guides on how to live. The Minobamadiziwin on how to live the good life. Chimigwitch, Chimigwitch. I really love being able to share stories um, about, about my teacher. And um, we can sit here and go on and go on for a long time and, and keep talking. I'll share, I'll share another one with you that, um, that she used to tell us, you know, when I was in, uh, when I was in school, uh, you know, I wasn't the greatest, greatest of students. Well, I'll be honest with you. I wasn't the greatest of students, um, but somehow I listened to the stories and they ended up you know, helping me as they do each and every day. And uh, I got into some trouble and I ended up uh, sitting on the steps of gym class and crying one day. And she came, her, her door, her arts and crafts place was, was right next to the gymnasium. And she came and she asked me what was wrong, you know, and I said, oh, blah, 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 so-and-so, you know, said this because I was acting like this and now I'm in, in this time out. You know, when I was crying, you know, and I was pretty upset. She said, I'll tell you a story. I said, oh, okay. And she said, a long time ago, um, the world was always cold. And Grandmother Moon would look down upon the earth in a cold way. And as she looked down, she noticed on the shores of the lake, there was a little girl who was crying and crying. And Grandmother Moon was curious on why this, why this little life was in such pain and had such sorrow. 
So she reached out and talked to the little girl. And she said, why are you crying? And the little girl said, my parents are really mean to me. She goes, they say mean things to me. They hurt my feelings. She said, and I just don't even want to go back there. I don't want to be with them anymore. She said, so I, I'm down here by the lake crying. And Grandmother Moon was moved by this little girl and told the little girl, well, you go back home and you tell your parents to treat them, to treat you right. And you tell your parents that it was I, Grandmother Moon, who told you to say that to them. And the little girl, you know, kind of wiped the tears off of her cheeks, you know, so amazed that, that Nokomis, that Grandmother Moon would, would be talking in this way with her. So the little girl did, she, she went back to her wigwam, she went back to her home and she told her parents what Grandmother Moon had said to her. And the parents didn't believe her. Her, her parents ridiculed her, called her names again, said that she was lying, you know, and they, they treated her bad and all the little girl could do was cry. Well, the next night, as Grandmother Moon was looking over the earth, she looked down and she saw the little girl there crying again. And she spoke to her again. And she asked, why are you crying again? She said, oh, Grandmother Moon, I did just what you had asked. I went back there and I told them what you told me to tell them. And they didn't believe me. And they hit me and they called me names and they hurt me. And she said, I don't want anything to do with them. I can't go back there, Grandmother Moon. I can't go back there. And Grandmother Moon now was pitying the young woman, the, the little girl. And she told the little girl, you come back here when I'm full and rising. And I will have something for you. And the little girl again wiped her tears and went back to her home. And the next night, she went to the spot where Grandmother Moon had spoken to her. And as Grandmother Moon was rising, she shone a path of light across the water to the little girl and she told the little girl come to me and she said i can't grandmother moon she said walk across the light walk across the bridge of light and you can be with me and the little girl was scared at first and she took a first step and she found she could walk on the light bridge and she crossed it. She crossed that light bridge all the way to Grandmother Moon. And when she got there, she embraced Nokomis. She held her. And it said that the love that the little girl had for Grandmother Moon warmed Grandmother Moon's heart. And, after, and when it warmed her heart, then the earth had begun to warm. Then every night after that, the parents of the little girl would go out to that spot and look for their child and ask the grandmother moon for their forgiveness. Oh, chi miigwech. Chi miigwech in Dunaway Maganiduk. Miigwech to all my relatives out there. Um, as you know, we only have so much time. 
and I could keep on going on. I have 20 different flutes with 20 different voices and 20 different stories and, you know, so I hope everybody enjoyed uh, tonight's storytelling and I believe we're going to have some, uh, some uh, Q and A, some questions. And uh, if anybody is looking for any resources on some of the, some of the more traditional stories, then I do have right here, this is the Mashomas book that has more of the, the Winnebuju stories in there. Um, I realized I didn't cover, uh, I covered one Winnebuju story and, and got into some of, uh, some of the storytelling that's more specific to the village, to my village. This is a great resource, the Mashomas book it's called. And also, if you want to know more about Anishinaabe life and culture, this is an excellent book as well. Um, the Cultural Toolbox by Anton Troyer. And this happens to be out there somewhere. This is The Robin. And this is a book written by my teacher, um, Dolores Bambridge, who, as I said, had the honor um, to go to school with from kindergarten until I graduated. And I hope you guys really enjoyed uh, tonight's session and miigwetch for having me. Liz, I think you're muted. No, we can't hear you. How about this? Can you hear me now? Yeah, you're good. Yep, you're good. Okay, great. Well, I was going to say, Michael, thank you so much. Every, you know, I could listen all night, as I'm sure the 500, 600 other people that were here tonight. Um, we just loved it. We have some questions. If you have a minute, we may go over a little bit. Uh, but there were just some really great questions, um, especially from the kids. I know you do a lot of school programs and uh, and just fascinating. And I'm glad you introduced the whole world to Boogad. That's a good word to know. <laughs> oh, my sisters texted. We were all laughing so hard at that. Anyway. OK, so eight year old Tabby wonders if there is a real wolf on your wall. Could you tell us more about the masks and the wolf behind you? He's actually a fox. Okay. He's actually a fox back there. Um, I make masks, and in the traditional Anishinaabe stories, Winnebuju he shapeshifts into different uh, different animals. So a lot of times when I tell the stories, if I told a story about the wolf, for instance, I would wear it and be able to tell uh, the story of that animal. That's wonderful. There he is back there. I talk to him once in a while. <laughs> um, and then the other thing, you talked a lot about Dee Bainbridge, who I think anybody who knew her loved her. Um, I was friends with one of her daughters and I see one of her other daughters was on tonight, um, which oh, was just great. a blessing to have her here with us. Um, it's always, God, heart. yeah, it's always good uh, when we bring Dee into the conversation. She was an absolute blessing. So one of the questions from the audience tonight was, is grandmother another word for teacher? Because you use them interchangeably. Or at in least the, you did for D. Yeah. In the culture, um, you know, we take on the persona of aunt and uncle the older we get. <clears throat> and that's the same for our grandmothers. You know, after my biological grandmother passed, um, we took to call in my auntie, Jenny Goslin, Grandma Jenny. And, you know, we all play those parts because we're all part of one family. And it's another way of bringing us closer together. Thank you. Uh, little eight-year-old Owen wants to know, how many flute songs can you play? Well, you know, um, I really don't know. I can, I, I have 20 flutes okay. and there's 20 different songs to each flute. But recently I've been learning stuff like Beethoven, um, getting more classical. 
on it because music is really a universal language and it doesn't matter you know um your cultural background because that music is going to affect you in that in that way and um i'm always honored and i'm very blessed to be able to share that flute music because like in the story when people stop to listen to that music i see the same effect on people especially in airports and in airports people are traveling from one place to the other and they're from all over the world and no matter what language they speak as soon as they hear that flute they actually slow down a little bit and they listen and they take a moment and they listen and that always astonishes me and i'm always blessed to be just that little a little bit um part of that they had another follow-up question about that that these are beautiful songs and are they played the same way each time or do they kind of come from the heart and you play them differently each time they grow like flowers they really do um a lot of it i learned in the woods being immersed into that uh, pristine environment and um i play what what most would call a pentatonic scale and i didn't learn that until many years after i was playing um, but that's like one of the first musical skills that is recorded um and yeah we each song i play is a different song and, and of course um we're also getting a lot of questions about your attire and your your face uh yes. Pete, so can you explain a little bit more about what's going on okay this is a traditional i'm, I'm a traditional dancer also a flute player and my mother and um many of my friends have pitched in to help make this i was i was living in a in a tough way at one time so my grandmother from a lodge uh connie mose actually made this vest and it's got a butterfly on it and the butterfly of course stands for new beginnings um the flowers headband is done by a bad river a uh, friend of mine and um yeah i just love it it's so beautiful the face paint that i wear is um it's for as a form of storytelling as i as i go along in life and and storytell it's like a different kind of a a hat that you would wear when you go to work and um something that the spirits would recognize me as and i started doing this when i was a young man and I went on my first fast in the woods. Um, I was taught to uh, take some medicines and use them on my face for, uh, so the spirits would recognize me. And in the same sense, um, as I, I present myself to you tonight, you know, I become uh, that teacher in that teacher role. And um, yeah, so it's a part of, part of who we are, part of our makeup. I just wanted to pass on uh, two messages from Ida and Paul, these kids. Ida! Uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> Ida said, um, thank you for honoring my mother, Dee Bainbridge, oh, and her oldest lovely. daughter. I recognize you, and I love your flute. And then Paul, her uh, son, said, Dee was a pioneer, and I'm certain that she's very proud of you, Michael. Oh. I'm sure that Ma is laughing tonight and saying miigwech. <laughs> which I'm sure she is too. <laughs> so thanks, Paul and Ida. That that means a lot to to Michael and and me. I'm I'm actually kind of tearing up thinking about her. No, um, she was a beautiful woman, um, inside and out. Uh, we do have a nice little question from 12 year old Miguel, and I know we're running a little late, but how did you get your name, Laughing Fox? Miguel wants to know. Well, um, you know, we we kind of had to relearn. Um, our culture. And when I came, became the age where we fast, um, I tried to go out and fast. And, and the, the person who was going to put me out on a fast had let me know. He let me know. He's like, do you have a, a Indian name? Do you have a Anishinaabe name, a spirit name? And I said, no. And he said, well, you need to have a name before you go out there. And, and so that the spirits can recognize you. And so I gave tobacco you know, which is one of our four sacred medicines to a person who knew the name in ceremony. And he took that tobacco and the gifts that I gave him and, and he prayed for a name. 
and he smoked the tobacco in his pipe. And later, later on the following spring, when all the spirits wake up, then he had a name for me and he presented me uh, with that name, Bape Wagush. Now, normally for a spirit name, you know, we would give that to our newborn children. But because of, you know, colonization and, you know, the, we, the ways were, were oppressed. So, you know, I use my name, Bape Wagush, Laughing Fox, as more of a form of, of empowerment to help empower um, our culture and our language. And really so that other people can hear how beautiful it sounds and we could um, slowly make our way back to, to naming our kids again um, in, our, in our language. You know, don't get me wrong, Michael sounds cool, but you know, there are so many Michaels in the world that you could wrap us around the world twice. <laughs> and probably two thirds of us would perish because of the water. So, <laughs> miigwech for the questions. <laughs> Um, the other thing, we're getting a lot of questions about how to get a hold of you. Kristen, could you put up uh, the slide with his? Oh, she's also putting the website in the in the chat box. A lot of people are looking at trying to buy a CD, and that's available on your website, I believe, right? Yeah. You it, also have a YouTube channel. It leads you to a band camp. The band camp has uh, my albums on there. Okay. And there are, there are storytelling on the albums. So these are all ways that people can yeah. get a hold of you. Um, oh, yes, yeah, sure. I'll hold up the books again. <laughs> yeah, they definitely, definitely want to know about the books. These are some good, just some good resources for you people or for anybody who would like to learn a little bit more about the culture. The Mishomish book is, is great, and it does have the seven grandfather teachings in it, which I think is used in a lot of classrooms. So it's a great resource for teachers. Right. You know, you're exactly right about that. Um, well, I think that's about all we have uh, time tonight. Um, there's a few more questions, but they're probably going to have to get a hold of you. Uh, and follow up with it. And we'll be sure to send you, Michael, the um, questions and, and hopefully we can, we can get some emails exchanged so you can get in touch with folks if that would be okay. Yes. Awesome. Yeah. And um, how, how far are you? Well, I would say, uh, how far are you willing to travel? But I know he's willing to travel because Michael's going to a Crazy Horse Monument this weekend, I believe, to do an event. So that's out in South Dakota. So um, I'm sure you're willing to, to go around Wisconsin a little bit to share your stories as well. Yes, yes. And hopefully when COVID lifts, I'll be traveling uh, to different communities around the world. Yeah, that would be great. No. Um, the other thing, uh, oh, if Kristen, if you could just put up the next slide. I just want to remind everyone that we're we're doing four of these. Uh, next week, we have Edith Bardo Lioso, who's from Bad River, uh, my tribe, just around the corner from Michael. We're about 45 minutes apart, our reservations. And same time, same place uh, next week at 7 p.m. Tuesday. And then we'll hopefully have Michael in the audience. And maybe you can get some good stump questions for, for Edith. Nice. The, the last thing we have is uh, please tell us what you thought. Go to our, our survey. We have a little survey at the end. It's also a place where you can add questions. It also is a place where you can tell us more of what you want. There's a lot of questions in here, Michael, about flutes. We might have to do a whole separate thing just on the history of, of flutes with you. Uh, there's a lot of questions about um, bone flutes and and Oh, do you have other ones? Do you, you know, just like you said, you have 20 different flutes. Um, so there was a lot of interest there. So yeah, just give us some more information on that. We would love to hear what you're thinking, what you thought of tonight, and what you'd like to learn more of. We're really excited to share this entire series with you. We're thrilled um, we got to share Michael with you and that he shared his knowledge with us. I'm just so grateful. So grateful. Miigwech. Miigwech. 
All right. We'll say good night and we'll see you guys next week. Okay. Bye.